This is the Nook Podcast. My name is Stephen, and I am honored to have you here with me today. Things are going a different direction for the month of June, and I hope you're here for it. More on that in just a moment. First, a quick reminder that I am always reachable by email if you have any questions or feedback about this podcast. The address is stephen at nookpodcast.com. That address is always in the show notes, along with a link to Buy Me a Coffee, which is just a simple and safe way for you to contribute financially to this show. June gloom is a California term for a weather pattern that results in cloudy, overcast skies with cool temperatures during the late spring and early summer. While it is most common in the month of June, it can occur in surrounding months, giving rise to other colloquialisms such as May Gray, No Sky July, and Foggest. Low altitude stratus clouds form over the cool water of the California current and spread overnight into the coastal regions of California. Right now you might be asking, what in the world am I listening to? For now, let's go with calling it a metaphor. This month of June will be dedicated to talking about depression. And while that may sound depressing, it's a topic that needs more discussion. And while it seems that this topic has gained some traction in awareness, I believe that there are still a lot of people who don't deal with depression who are operating in way too many assumptions. Clinical depression isn't just feeling sad. It isn't something that one can shake off. So consider this a four-week series on the subject that we all think we know about, but few really want to talk about. But you don't want to talk about it. A recent study suggests that more than 300 million people in all age groups suffer from depression, and it is currently the leading cause of disability worldwide. Very recent data shows that one in four adults reported symptoms of depressive disorder. That's 25% of the United States population. At 16, I wanted to die. And now I'm 22 and sometimes I still want to, only I'm afraid to try to. The problem with keeping depression a secret is that it only serves to exacerbate the illness. Keeping depression a secret gives it every ounce of your power. Every basic primal piece of you is screaming for you to survive. Aged 12 to 25 have the highest rates of depression. Our kids and our young people are suffering the most, and that bothers me. And I hope that by the end of this series, that it bothers you too. Because it's a mental illness, it can be a lot harder to understand than, say, high cholesterol. One major source of confusion is the difference between having depression and just feeling depressed. Don't be afraid. Clinical depression is different. It's a medical disorder, and it won't go away just because you want it to. It lingers for at least two consecutive weeks and significantly interferes with one's ability to work, play, or love. Depression can have a lot of different symptoms. A low mood, loss of interest in things you'd normally enjoy, changes in appetite, feeling worthless or excessively guilty, sleeping either too much or too little, poor concentration, restlessness or slowness, loss of energy, or recurrent thoughts of suicide. If you have at least five of those symptoms, according to psychiatric guidelines, you qualify for a diagnosis of depression. Don't be afraid. like to think that my metaphor makes a little more sense now. We're going to take four weeks and look at different aspects of depression, the June gloom. 
If one in four people are dealing with this, you probably know someone who has it. And if it's you, you are not alone. You are not a freak. You are known and loved by God. So let's get into this. Joining me to start this series is a returning guest, Jim Barnard. He was just on this show a few weeks ago when we discussed his wife's long-term illness and how they have had to cope with all of her care. What we didn't get into was how Jim's battle with depression reached a brutal peak just over three years ago and landed him in an inpatient facility for a 30-day stay. You can imagine that there is a lot to this aspect of his story. So settle in for this new conversation with Jim Barnard. The first time you and I talked, obviously it was so much about your book, um, about the things that you had dealt with where your wife's illness is concerned. And you, like so many, I literally lost track of how many people that I've called and invited on the show that we we talk about one topic. And just in passing, my guest says, oh yeah, well then I, I had dealt with some depression back then and it just mm-hmm. time after time after time. Um, so what what caught my ear about your specific story was that you actually had to go away to a program and in just honesty I've well I've yeah. met a lot of people who've dealt with depression I've never met someone who actually went away to a facility so yeah. I would love uh, first of all when when was that Wow. It was three years ago, a little over three years ago that I was there. Uh, it's a joint called Honey Lake Clinic down in uh, close to Tallahassee, Florida. Um, yeah, we, I, I lovingly ago. call it. Yeah, I lovingly call it the nut farm, right? It, wow. it was a, a place where <laughs> a bunch of different Not people with a bunch anyone of different who issues. Else, anyone else who has visited. <laughs> yeah, but you hang on. Oh, I know exactly what you if, mean, though. If you don't laugh, sometimes you're going to cry, right? So, um, you know, a lot of the people that came down to Honey Lake were dealing with depression and anxiety. Some people were dealing with OCD stuff, some people Mm. with addiction issues. There was just this melting pot of of people that were struggling in profound ways. And, man, when I I went there, I was so depressed out of my mind. Like, I (laughs) – to, to tell the full story, I probably have to go back to my childhood, but but um, to just tell you this part, man, I'm so thankful for Honey Lake because it's a medically based Christian treatment center and they do wonderful work. Uh, they, uh, you know, I, I had a, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, I did neurofeedback, I was in Bible studies, people prayed over us, like it, it wasn't just... You know, hey, uh, be a little bit more spiritually disciplined and you will get better. It was a matter of, uh, you know, looking at the holistic thing. If you've got a physical problem, let's find the physical solutions that you need. Um, it was it was a, a really hard experience, but I'm so grateful that I went down to Honey Lake. And uh, I really don't want to disparage anyone that makes that dis- that decision. Um, it 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 really was a, a a bold move, but I'm I'm so glad that I did it. Well, and, and I I honestly understand what you're saying in that after my diagnosis, it it was hard to have to realize how far back things stretch. It's like you start connecting the dots that you mm-hmm. didn't just wake up one day like that. You can you can kind of see the the story arc. Um, was there a last straw? if you will, that, that caused you to come to that conclusion. I have, I have got to get some deep, deep help for this. You know, I, I didn't make that decision probably. Mm. Uh, I, I was so, 
so dark and so down. Um, at that point, I really couldn't get out of bed. Oh, wow. Uh, my, my wife, I think, found it. I don't know if anyone uh, told her about it or if she was just, just scouring the internet. But the next thing I knew, I was uh, on a plane, a, a red-eye flight down to Tampa, renting a car one way up to Tallahassee, having some kid pick me up at the Tallahassee airport and showing up at this joint. Um, just scared out of my mind, mm. absolutely petrified. Um, all these nurses rush around me and start getting my vitals. They're drawing blood. They're swabbing my mouth. They're getting my temperature, blood pressure, all all the stuff, trying to get my my baseline, I guess, mm. uh, for for me coming into this place. And it was uh, it was really terrifying because, like, on top of that, they are um, inspecting your luggage. Like, what mm. what did you bring in that you uh, that that's not allowed here. You know, wow. anything from drugs and alcohol, um, sugar, caffeine's not allowed there. My nail clippers got taken away from me because I could hurt myself with my nail clippers. Mm. Uh, you know, and then there was a strip search. Like this was a really intense moment for for me, and I'm sure everyone that that enters into a facility like this. But you know, I'm really glad that they go through those steps because like I said, people are coming in with like all these different levels of issues. I I've never struggled with drugs or alcohol, so that wasn't going to be the thing I was sneaking in. But, um, when I first got to this place and got through all that initial stuff, man, I was trapped in bed for two or three days before I started engaging before mm. I started to go down to the meal hall and, you know, <laughs> hang out with other people and started going to the classes and the groups and the activities that they had planned for me. I finally just had to give up and relent and say, mm. all right, like I'm here for a purpose. Um, I was just really disorientated, man. Like it was, it was, it was crazy. It really was. But you, would you say you still have a pretty clear memory of all of that? Or is it like, almost like you can, I don't know. I have moments where it's like you're, you're, you're in an observation tank watching something there's yeah. like a there's almost like a disassociation to what is truly happening but there the moments where you're like wait a second this is me almost like you're living in a weird yeah. dream yeah like a th out of body kind of thing yeah. like you're a yeah. third person watching it and someone's recording this for prosperity or a movie or something yeah absolutely i i think i remember all of the the things um I just, man, I would, I was not responding well to anything at that point. Um, maybe, if, Stephen, if it's okay, could I like back up like a, oh, sure. a, a ton and kind of share my long-standing story with depression because yes. it, it may help kind of paint the picture a little bit better. Oh, absolutely. So when I was a kid, um, you know, my my mom really struggled with depression. Uh, she was probably really manic. Uh, mm. Things were not the way they were supposed to be. And I knew it when I was young. I remember being four or five years old and just realizing that that things weren't awesome. Um, her mom actually was, I think, really depressed. There was a rotating circle of men mm. um, in my mom's life that was very damaging and I think very abusive. And so, you know, the the depression that was real for my mom's mom was probably real for her. And the abuse that came out of that was just tragic. And mm. um, my parents eventually got divorced when I was about 11. Uh, when they got divorced, man, things blew up like <laughs> significantly. I remember my mom attacking my dad with a knife. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, yeah. And like this, this epic, tragic moment that I remember trying to call 911. <laughs> At and I couldn't dial that. Yeah, I couldn't dial the numbers that they make purposely easy in the correct order. I'm like, nine one nine, no one one nine, no one nine one. Like, what is my deal? Oh, wow. It was a tragic moment. Like, this is uh, a memory that I've had to do some deep therapy on. Um, therapies like EMDR. Uh, it's it's slanted my view of myself and my identity. Mm. Um, so when everything kind of started to even out, uh, my, my dad moved away 
He moved to Virginia. My siblings were all older and out of the house at this point. And so it was just me and my mom. Mm. And she was dealing with her own chaos and her own grief. And no one was trying to help me through this at all. Like no one wanted to guide me in this season. Well, you and were I essentially never... the man of the house at that point. Yeah, that's great at 11 years old. Sure. Oh, man. What a mess. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, since I didn't know what to do, I had no context for this. I just shut down. I, I knew that I hated the emotions inside of me, mm. and I didn't want uh, to share it with anyone. I didn't want anyone to know. So for a long time, Stephen, I became a selective mute. I literally didn't talk on a given day unless I absolutely had to. So if a teacher would call on me, I definitely wasn't raising my hand, but if a teacher was calling on me, I would answer, I would reply, but in as few words as possible. And, uh, you know, outside of that, I'd sit on the corner of the playground by myself uh, during recess. After school, I would run straight home. I'd go straight up to my bedroom. And often my bedroom didn't feel safe enough. Mm. I would literally climb into my closet and my closet became a great analogy for depression because that's what I was. I was de a depressed kid. Some of it might have been natural uh, based on uh, genetics, based yeah. on family heritage, but a lot of it was circumstantial. And I just, I felt trapped. I remember sitting in that closet, just praying to God that he would send someone to open that door and just tell me it was going to be okay. Mm. And that door never opened. So for a long time, I, I really, I, I, I was really just trapped in this mode. You know, eventually I started to visit my dad out in, in Virginia for summers. And when he was uh, out there, he's like, hey, I really want you to, to, um, to go to church with, with me. You know, this is really important. And uh, he had remarried and I was like, okay, you know, I'll go to church. I think I love Jesus. I don't know. And so I, um, I started going to church with, with them. And then eventually he asked me to go to, um, to youth group. And I was like, all right, you know, I'll go to respect you, but I'm not going to participate. Like, mm -hmm. it's just not, it's not the mode I'm in, but I went and I, and I met this youth pastor who was quite literally the coolest person I had ever met. He was mm -hmm. a professional bodybuilder. Oh, wow. uh, he just, he like looked cool. He talked cool. Like every woman wanted him <laughs> and you know, he loved Jesus. And, and for some reason he decided to invest himself into me and it made a difference in my life. Like I felt like I had value for the first time mm. in a long time. So I started to step out of that proverbial depression closet and I started to participate in it. It felt good. And he eventually led me to Christ. Um, I'm so thankful for this man. His name's Joby Martin. He's a pastor of a, a really quickly growing church down in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. So shout out to Joby. Um, I, I, I owe him a lot. Um, Do you still keep in touch with I, him? You know what? When I got out of Honey Lake uh, three years ago, I made a drive over to Jacksonville because it wasn't that far. Oh, and I was wow. able to spend a few minutes with him. He didn't have much time after oh, church, but I, I got to see him and we've texted a little bit. He's, he's super busy. So I, I haven't gotten to spend as much time, but I, I, I hope that he heard that I was really thankful because he yeah. made a huge difference in my life. Like really the, the difference that Jesus made was significant. Mm. Um, Stephen, you, this isn't a humble brag at all. Do you remember, do you remember the senior year superlatives in the high school uh, yearbook? Oh yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Best hair. You probably had best beard, right? No, no, no. I was most talented. <laughs> Uh, hum Ooh. Humble brag. <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> Still don't know what that man. means. <laughs> well, you're 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 very talented. You're crushing it here on the nook. I I, I love it. Um, well, I got voted on two of these dang things, and I had a pretty big class, 425 students in my graduating class, and it was class clown and most likely to become famous. And <laughs> once again, that doesn't go on my resume, right? Like, that's that's really not that big oh, of a deal. You don't deal. have that on your LinkedIn page? How do you know? <laughs> you know what? I should update that. I really should. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. That's awesome. Um, but this is the transformation that Jesus made in my life, like sad sack of a kid to like 
class clown. Like I, I, I just can't comprehend it any other way mm. besides besides Jesus. And so, you know, to fast forward the story after college, I ended up moving down to St. Louis, down in your neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I met my wife, Alicia, my beautiful, sweet, amazing wife, Alicia. And, uh, you know, we, listeners could go back several episodes and hear all about that story of, mm -hmm. of suffering and how, and how Alicia got sick three months into our marriage. And it was devastating to me. Like I, here's the thing, Stephen, I think that grief is a habit. I think it's something that we go back to when we're hurting. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a, a, a almost muscle memory. And the way I had learned to grieve was to step into this depression closet, to mm -hmm. isolate, to pull away. And so that's literally what I did. I was so overwhelmed by this new reality and this expectation gap that was painful. It was disappointing. It was uh, distressing to me. I just I hated it so much. And I, I, I wanted to just be away from everyone. Yeah. And I, I, I was pretty effective at it. I really, um, I really did a good job of hiding. Mm. And I think there was like this new wave of depression that was just coming over me. And thankfully I was, you know, part of a church community that was, you know, surrounding me and, and loving me and, and not truly letting me be alone. But if I'm being honest, man, I there was some rough moments in there, like moments where I'm just breaking down in, in a bathtub, in, in my clothes, just mm -hmm. like, I don't know what's going to happen with Alicia. Like, I think she's going to die, you know, today, maybe like, this is this is it, like, I'm, I'm going to be all alone. And, uh, and so I was just kind of preparing myself to be all alone. And um yeah, depression was was real and, you know, tried to fight through it. You know, saw some counselors and my, my pastor was really involved and, you know, just tried to muddle through, really. Well, we ended up moving out to Denver for me to go to seminary because God had been poking at me for so long to do ministry and I had been giving him the Heisman stiff arm and I just didn't want to do it. But when we got out to Denver... Um, you know, we walked away from this great community that was like really keeping me, you know, fairly okay. Mm. Um, and uh, I was doing seminary, master's work part time. I was working full time. Alicia couldn't drive. She was super sick. She was a fall risk, twenty four hours a day. Uh, our little boy was nine months old, and um, I, I this was all too much for me. Like mm. I literally was breaking down every three weeks, like crying out to God, like, I can't do this. I'm like, <laughs> forget this. We're moving back to St. Louis. I hate this so much. Mm. And um, I wish that I would have like, like sought out a counselor during that season, but it felt like I was too busy. Like I just, I couldn't pull that lever. Mm. And that's like the biggest regret that I have of that season is not seeking out intentional help, just trying to muddle through, trying to have Alicia encourage me when I'm having these meltdowns, and uh, which is great. I, I, I love Alicia for her strength and, um, you know, just, you know, how driven she is. But mm. I needed more than just her. I needed I needed other people to hold my arms up, you know. So eventually I got a job at a church um, out here in Denver, and that was a better gig for me than what I was doing. Um, it was a job that I could be a little bit flexible to do seminary with. And um, it, it wasn't my dream church, but it was a good experience, you know. Mm. And I worked there for, I don't know, three, three and a half years. And I had one of these uh, departures from the church that – I think you'll get this, Stephen. I, I wish I would have gotten a good exit interview because mm. it was, um, let's say, painful. It was sure. It was it was a divorce. Um, I felt like I lost everything in this departure. That's a good way to put and, it. That's only because I can relate one hundred percent. It's not just a job you leave. Gosh, yeah. I mean, if you work in a church and and you leave, whether it's your choice or not, it's, it, there's some like tragicness to it. Cause you're, you have to step away from your community, mm. not just your job. Like people leaving jobs all the time, like that's hard for them, but 
leaving a church is kind of next level. And, uh, you know, for six months after that, I fell apart. I, this was a, I could not get out of bed season. Mm -hmm. This wasn't the, I can't get out of bed season that sent me to Honey Lake. Um, this was me trying to like pick up the pieces and try to figure out what, what I needed to do. Do I need to move back to St. Louis and just get a regular job? Maybe mm -hmm. I'm not good at ministry. Maybe, um, I just don't know. I, like, I literally didn't apply for a single job over a mm -hmm. six month period. And God gave me a, 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 a gig at a new church uh, I, like, that I literally didn't apply for. It was, it was an absolute gift from God. And I'm so thankful for it. It's a church called LifeGate. And um, when this pastor reached out to me and was like, hey, man, like, you, you're someone that likes small groups and discipleship. I could really use someone like you on my team. I was like, no, man, I'm you're going to want to fire me just like this previous <laughs> pastor did. Like, <laughs> yeah. So this, uh, this guy really wanted to hire me and I was not into it at all. I uh, was actively praying against it, but he was, he was pretty kind and, and was very like gracious. Uh, I think you're the man for the job. I don't know why, but um, you know, start, start coming to LifeGate and start, praying about this. Like, let's, let's try to figure out if this is going to be a good fit or not. Mm -hmm. So I started coming, I was praying about it, probably praying against it. And eventually I felt like God was calling me like, yeah, you're like, this is the right move. Go ahead and, uh, and do this. And I was legitimately fearful. I, I don't know why I probably should have just heard God prompting and said, okay, like, God, I can trust you with this. But, um, you know, I, I hurt really bad from from this experience that I had. And so when I started on staff with LifeGate, I asked Alicia if uh, if she thought maybe it would be a good idea for me to get on antidepressants. Mm. And she said, you know, I, don't be mad, but yeah, I kind of would like to see what, what you're like uh, on, on these things. And so I went and found a doctor and said, hey, you know, hey, I, I, I think I'm depressed. And she said, all right, well, here, take this survey. And the, the survey is basically like eight or 10 questions rephrasing, mm -hmm. are you depressed? So I take this thing and I turn it back in. And she's like, oh, yeah, it looks like you're depressed. Like this was the diagnostic <laughs> tool, right? Yep. Which I guess I guess makes sense. They can't really like prick your finger, draw your blood yeah. and, you know, run it like your blood sugar. Like, yeah, it's, there's no it's, MRI to tell you if you have yes. a, if you have depression. Yeah. So. She, uh, she says, all right, um, Jim, do you want to take uh, Lexapro or Paxil? And I'm like, lady, how in the world should I know? <laughs> You're I the expert. No idea. <laughs> and she just was oh, simply man. like, okay, well, the, every drug has its pros and cons and advantages and disadvantages. Just, you know, choose one. I'm like, um, okay, well, I think I know a couple guys that are on Lexapro. They seem neat. Why don't I get on that? <laughs> Oh, man, what an endorsement. <laughs> yeah, right. And she seemed to think that that was a great decision making process. Like, oh, that sounds great. Let's do that. So she put me on Lexapro. And for the first year, it was it was fine. It was good. You know, I had to go back after a year to get a prescription refill. And she asked me how you're doing. And I said, well, I really enjoy my job. I actually found a really great home at LifeGate and some really great community and was enjoying a lot of that. But the realities of stuff that was going on with Alicia were still really hard. And I just was like, you know what, I, I'm probably about the same. Mm. And she's like, oh, we should have you take the survey. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> let's take the survey, whatever. And she concluded that I probably needed to go up in dosage because mm. higher dosage means more benefits. Right. So I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense, I guess. You know, so I jumped onto this higher uh, version of Lexapro and congruently there was some tragic things that happened circumstantially in life. Um, Alicia's therapy that had been working for her, that gave her a nice season of plateau in her health. The insurance company said, Hey, we're not going to pay for that anymore. And uh, that was devastating news for me. Mm -hmm. All right. How much is this going to cost? Like we gotta, we gotta keep her going on this. 
well, it was going to be like $300,000 a year. And I was like, no, 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 this is terrible. Like that was happening at that time. I was going through bankruptcy. Something had happened at church that was unfortunate. Some like extended family stuff, like all these things I could look at and be like, I don't know how to deal with this. This pisses me off. I cannot even deal with this right now. You know, like it was all these circumstances that I could say, that's the reason I'm bad. Mm -hmm. So for about a year, I was in just fake it until I could make it mode. Like I would just like gusto up as much energy and enthusiasm as I could on a Sunday morning to get church set up, to rally up all the, the volunteers, all the different you know teams and just give them just this boost of energy. Like, come on, like we're going to, there's new people coming to church today. Let's make this happen. But um, I, on the inside, I was like dead. Sure. I had no, How do you know? no energy. Yeah. I, I, I was like, I was so dry on the inside, but if I could just get to about 1 PM on Sunday, you know, things would be okay. And, uh, I would get through it, but, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I felt like I was faking it well enough that no one could really tell what was wrong with me. And I couldn't tell what was wrong with me. I just knew these things were terrible. So eventually my leadership team, a team that I served on, um, at the church, they scheduled this special one-off Monday night meeting. And I was like, Oh, what's the agenda for this thing? And they like, wouldn't tell me. And I'm mm. like, Oh. Oh no, I'm the agenda. Alicia, wow. I'm getting fired again. Oh my gosh, like this is happening to me again. I knew this was going to happen again. And so I just started to like brace for impact. And I I was the agenda for that night, but not because I was getting fired, but because these guys came around and said, "Hey man, we've we've watched you get dark and seemingly depressed. You've been isolating a ton. You're just not yourself yeah. for maybe like a year. Like they, they saw a clear shift in me and they apologized. Like Steven, they, they said, we, we should have come to you forever ago and asked like, how are you? What's going on? How can we help? Mm. But we never did. We just figured you'd shake out of it. And, uh, so please forgive us. Like as the church, we should have been doing this a long time ago, but now we're asking you, how are you? What's going on? How can we help? And I, I just broke down. I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm just crying and snotting. I, like, mm. I'm just not right. I don't know. Well, you had to feel like your whole world was crashing in just on that list of things that you, you went through. What is, it's almost like what else could possibly go wrong? Mm. Uh, yeah. Tell, tell me in those in that that moment, I mean, it had to almost be relieving that they were recognizing this in you. Uh, but was that solace or was it was it shame? I mean, it, it, is there a way for you to even kind of quantify what it what it felt like in that moment that you were essentially exposed? Yeah. Wow, what a good question. I think. Right at the moment, it felt like shame. It felt like I had let everyone down. Mm. They were so kind to me to say, it's okay. Like, we want you to take a couple months off and you're not in trouble. Your job's not in jeopardy. Like, you can you can get rid of that thought. Um, if you need to get away and, and go on vacation, go do that. Uh, if just hit the reset button. If you need to go to some place that's going to help you let like let we will help pay for whatever it is that you need let's let's make this happen so i think ultimately it felt like relief but that next day i started a, a two-month uh, sabbatical and and that's when i found myself like in bed so dark like i Stephen, I never made any like attempts on my life i wasn't like straight up suicidal but I, I didn't want to live. Mm -hmm. Like I, I did not want to wake up. <laughs> I remember mornings waking up and just like being disappointed. Like, God, can you just take me? Wow. Cause I, cause I, I was just so off kilter, like nothing made sense. And when I didn't have work, when I didn't have church as something to like define my life around, it felt like I had no identity that I was just like, hopeless. And 
yeah, that's when I guess Alicia found this Honey Lake place and I headed down there. It was, <laughs> I, I almost don't even have the words. Like I, I wanted to be hopeful, but I, I, I felt like I was going to be trapped in this mode forever. Hmm. Is there a way for you to then define, I mean, if, if Alicia felt that desperate watching you, uh, how would you say that she was, was feeling regarding, I mean, you're taking care of her. I, I hope folks can go back and listen to the episode where we really got into all of Alicia's illness. Um, I'm just trying to wrap my head around what that must have been like for you and for her, for this family unit, when it just seems like literally you're falling apart and there's, there's really no option at that point. Um, yeah. Can you can you even chronicle what some of those those conversations were like between you and Alicia when when something had to give? Yeah, first of all, I felt so crummy that she's the one that's sick. She's the one going through mm. the pain and I'm worse off. Like um, I'm I'm dealing with this way worse than she is. She was unbelievably patient with me. Um she never once made me feel like I'm letting her down or disappointing her mm. or hurting her. Um, I don't know if it was like a matter of, of, you know, you've, you've walked this path with me so long in, in my illness that I just need to walk with you now. It's my turn. Um, yeah. But she found a, a level of strength in her that I will never comprehend you know, me going away for 30 days, I was like, how does this even work? Like, you know, I, I'm the one to do everything. Mm -hmm. But she said, no, like, I, it doesn't matter. Like, we will figure it out. She just took every burden and every worry off of me. Gosh, she's so strong. I, <laughs> I think, I think that I deal, uh, I wouldn't have dealt as well with an emotional, like a depression issue mm -hmm. that you know, if, if the roles were reversed, like she was unbelievably gracious to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can deal with the sickness. It, like, I, I don't know if I could have dealt with this, if this is what she would have gone through. You talked about those, those first few days and how difficult it was for you to eventually throw yourself into the treatment. Uh, was there a definitive point where you feel like you turn the corner uh i mean in 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 essence I, I mean 30 days sounds like a long time especially when you know what is happening at home but mm -hmm. in the grand scheme 30 days doesn't seem like a whole lot either uh yeah did, did you turn a corner or did you just kind of get through it and have to buck up again and and motor on yeah great question the there was a time at, at Honey Lake where it was like a clear change. So meeting with my psychiatrist uh, several times, this one meeting, he gives me this report and it's a, it's a, uh, how do I put, say it? It's a, the results of a DNA test that hmm. they gave me when I first got there. Like when they were, all these nurses were rallying around me, they swabbed my mouth for DNA and sent it off to a lab. It's a thing called Genomind. Uh, there's uh, a bunch of different ones out there in the market, but um, you know this one, this report had three different columns for how my genes interact with different psychotropic drugs. Mm. So the first column is there's no known gene interactions. So seemingly you're probably going to do pretty well on this. Uh, we're not going to promise you or guarantee it because if something goes wrong, like liability on their end, of yeah. course. So, um, but you, you're probably going to be okay on one of these drugs. The second column is only be on this medication if you're under close medical supervision. And then the third column is do not take this drug. You will experience adverse effects. Mm. And my psychiatrist, Dr. Danny, slid this over to me and he's like, all right, find Lexapro on this and tell me which column it's on. Sure enough, it's on the adverse effects mm. column. He's like, this is why you're here. 
Wow. You are on a drug that's terrible for you. Now, to be clear, for anyone that's listening, um, Lexapro is not a bad drug. <laughs> it's, Side it's note. It's not a bad, yeah. Side note, I'm on Lexapro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We are all different individuals mm -hmm. and how our bodies respond is just different. Yeah. And so for, for, for me, Lexapro was bad for you. I'm guessing it's good. I yeah. don't know if for you've probably three years. never, that's awesome. Yep. I mean, honestly, Stephen, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, now at some point you may poop out on that. Oh yeah. Like, and they've told these, me that. Yeah. These drugs do kind of have like a, a shelf life of, a run. of effectiveness. Yeah. yeah. Well, and in truth is probably a little over a year ago that I felt like it was starting to decline for me. So mm -hmm. now they, now I, I, I take Lexapro and I've got a Wellbutrin booster that goes with oh. it, that. Yeah, okay. So that's my current cocktail uh, that also <laughs> seems to be working, but it's one of those things that I'm sure you you understand that you have to keep in yeah. close contact with your doctor and keep checking in mm -hmm. and uh, always monitoring how you're doing. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, Dr. Danny said, all right, here's the thing. We've got a list of medications that's on this seemingly good category. Like, um, I've gotten to know you. Uh, I've, I've understood a little bit of how your body works. I really want to try you on Wellbutrin. Mm. Can we switch you off of Lexapro? Let's wean you off. And will you trust me to put you on Wellbutrin? And you'll, you'll do this in the safety of of this place and in, in, in the safety of Honey Lake. And we'll be observing if things go sideways for some reason, we will make a change. We will take care of you. Mm. Um, I can't promise that we'll be able to sort this all out within 30 days, but you know, I, you're in good company here. Once I got on Wellbutrin and weaned off Alexapro, everything changed. Like this is the, 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 the moment of, of turnaround. Wow. You obviously wear glasses, Stephen, um, so you'll understand this reference. It's like my vision had gotten fuzzy mm -hmm. slowly over the years, like so slowly that you don't even notice it. It's just one day you're like, oh, I'm struggling to see the the blackboard, you know. Mm. And when when I got my first pair of glasses and put them on, I was just dumbfounded by like, oh, my gosh, guys, like. Yeah. You can see like this? Like HD. This is, <laughs> like, why didn't anyone tell me? Like, this is crazy. It was that kind of experience when mm. I got off of Lexapro and onto Wellbutrin. Once again, Wellbutrin might work for me and might work for you, but it might not work for someone else. Yep. Like, if, if I can encourage anyone out there to check out this DNA test, like, once again, Gentle Mind is the one I took. There's several of them out there. I just think that these psychotropic drugs are so serious that um, why not use the technology out there to yeah. limit some of the trial and error? Yeah. Because I, I my, my doctor, the, you know, back here in Denver, wasn't really watching me very closely. Mm. And I didn't know how to communicate that I wasn't well. Oh, sure. Um, so well, you don't like, know what you don't know in an instance like that. You just you just know that something is off. Or yeah. <laughs> way off. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Like, so my Honey Lake experience, I mean, if, if there was one thing that, that really made a difference, it was this DNA test and then getting on a med medication that would actually work for me and my genes. And mm. I'm so thankful for that. I did a bunch of other stuff at Honey Lake that was super beneficial. But that right there is the one thing. If I could have had that one doctor give me the DNA test on the front end, I think I would have avoided all this grief. Yeah. In fact, I went back to see her because I walked away from Honey Lake with a three month, uh, you know, prescription. Mm. And then at some point I needed to get that refilled. So I went back to see this doctor and she's like, Oh, it's been a while. Are you like, do you need a prescription for Lexapro? I'm guessing I'm like, yeah, see about that. I've got a story <laughs> now. <laughs> oh, yeah. With big reference. So, yeah, so I shared all this thing with her, and and uh, you know, I'm like, hey, doctor, I, I really need you to check out this DNA test because I, I'm afraid that there's going to be other gyms that come in and see you, mm. and you know, you you might blindly put them on something, and they won't know how to communicate that they're bad off, and yeah, you know, I I avoided the the big final you know kind of decision that 
I, I was praying for, but I didn't maybe have the courage to do. And I'm so thankful for, Yeah. but like, please don't do this anymore. Like, I would like to think that if you would have offered it to me, I would have taken it. And she's like, oh yeah. She opens up a drawer and pulls out a brochure for the thing. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, 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 that, that, that's the thing I'm talking about. <laughs> oh like, my gosh. Why did you not offer that to me? And she's like, well, I just don't know if I really believe in it. And if I've got someone that fails a drug like four or five times, you know, like maybe then that's when I pull that lever. Wow. I'm like, why? Well, it's expensive. I'm like, you know what? I think I paid $500 for this. You know, um, it is scary. It's murky. It, like it, it looks like it might cost thousands of dollars, but um, I think what they try to do is charge your insurance company for whatever they can get out of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when they, when they get whatever payment they can out of your insurance company, which my insurance is terrible, they weren't getting mm. anything. They just wrote off the difference and I paid three, $500, whatever. Yeah. Like, my life was worth that. Honestly, I would like to have my life, the $5,000 or whatever the initial scary bill looked like that would have been worth it because mm. I mean, this thing was for real. And, um, I don't know, like. Guys, if you're if you're listening and you're struggling with depression, if you're on a medication that doesn't feel like it's right, like don't don't let it just sit. Yeah. Don't waste another day. Like, Proactivity is so important. Oh my gosh, yeah. Like, reach out if you go to the Genome Mind website or like Google these genetic DNA tests for psychotropic drugs. There are providers in your area that offer this, you know, yeah. go, go see a psychiatrist, like whatever the cost is, I'm telling you it's worth it. I firmly believe it because my, my life is so much better. Like, mm. I, I wish I wouldn't have waited so long to oh, get sure. on medication. Um, well, like, especially I, when you combine that with you, you go on a Lexapro thinking that's the answer and it turns out to be. I mean, from what you're saying, it sounds like the thing that, that shoved you over the edge, that oh, yeah. that is what very likely, or at least you have to consider that this is the thing that, that almost was an end to you. Um, mm -hmm. And I, to me, there's a, a sick comedy. We've, we've talked about sometimes how you have to laugh the, the sick comedy that when they run the commercials for, for mental health drugs, that yeah. inevitably one of the side effects is suicidal thoughts. And I've <laughs> never understood that. This is supposed to be helping people deal with their depression, yet you're telling yeah. me that one of the side effects is that I may want to kill myself. Something mm -hmm. is so wrong with that. But I have I have such a deeper understanding of it now. And that's why I will preach that proactivity when I first went on Lexapro and it was a small dosage and the doctor wanted to be back in 30 days. He was mm -hmm. like, I'm glad you're here. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, you'd be surprised. Oh, you, wow. you put somebody on, on a drug and they think everything's fine. And so they just, they don't do the follow-up. And I said, so I'm the exception? He says, oh, by far. Yeah. And that blew my mind because I'm like, yeah. oh, <laughs> I'm going to follow up and follow up. And every time you tell me you want me to check in, I'm going to check in. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it was, went from a month to three months to six months. And because we're, we're on a, on a decent, uh, run with this for right now. And it just, mm. it baffles me to think that somebody would be, uh, haphazard or casual about their mental health. And maybe that's just another symptom, if you will, that, that the thing is, is out of control in, yeah. in, in the world today. Man, I'm so glad you said that because I I remember like I was seeing a counselor faithfully during this super dark season. I was praying as hard as I could. I wanted to talk it away mm. and I wanted to pray it away. But the reality was is I had a physical problem. Like it, it was a physical problem in my head, but yep. like if if my stomach hurt, I would have gone to see a doctor and I would have followed what the doctor said. Right. But for some reason, we were like, no, a, a physical problem in our head is something different. It's yeah. like some kind of weird taboo. It's awkward. And, and, I, and I do get it. But at the end of the day, if you have a physical problem, how are you going to get through it without a physical solution? Right. And I think that's where perhaps the greatest misconception, and I, and I realize that's a blanket statement, um, 
But the more that I've looked into things, the more that I've read articles and watched videos, I think that's the stigma that needs to be broken. And that's why I want to have conversations like this. Uh, sure, I could have I could have a month's worth of doctors come on and talk about these heady things. But I think yeah. it's a story like yours, Jim, that that is going to resonate with people because you and I, we're having real issues with a real issue. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it's only pro proactivity. And, and if I can pivot from there, uh, we've, we've talked plenty about kind of the science of it. I'm very curious in that 30 day stint, um, what was going on in your faith? I'm, I'm so glad that you were at a, a faith-based program, but obviously you were jug juggling plenty. Where was God in that stint? Where was God when you left? Yeah. Well, I, I, to the point of, okay, we've got physical problems, we've got mental problems, emotional and spiritual. Like those are the four realms that I, I really see. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. there's circumstantial and stuff. Sure. Um, I, I think my physical problem, uh, it was poison upstream and it affected the mental, the emotional and the oh, spiritual. Yeah. yeah. Good and so way to put I, it. I, I was legitimately pretty far from God when I entered into Honey Lake. Mm. Um, I, I, I would try reading my Bible and I would just reread the same verse. Like I swear a thousand times because the words had no meaning. There's yeah. just nothing in it. I would pray and, uh, you know, I, I just feel like no one was there and I'm just like, I'm just spewing negativity. And it was like, I don't know. It was like, I, I, I had no concept of, of what I was doing and how to do it effectively. Like I felt like the worst pastor of all time. Mm. And when the glasses came on, when I could see clearly after um, getting on Wellbutrin, yeah. man, things started to change for me spiritually. Like suddenly that that poison stream down in this in the spiritual end uh, started to to clear up. And I, I remember I, I have this set of uh, you know scripture journals, and I started to work through those. Like I can tell you the exact date I started to like find some clarity and I am writing feverishly about like, God, thank you for mm. like this gift of like clarity. I, I had no idea how unclear I was. And um, I don't know, like I, I felt like I could see God in so many beautiful ways. Yeah, I kind of became this like pastor, uh, de facto staff pastor. Um, amongst the, the the people at Honey Lake, and I was digging in with people and their stories and trying to encourage them. I was I was coaching them on on all these different levels. Like it felt really good. I felt like, oh my gosh, I could leave early. Like to your point earlier, thirty days doesn't seem like a long time, but I yeah. I had turned the corner so hard that I'm like, oh maybe I just go home. But I was so excited about trying to help other people in their journey. Yeah. Uh, and there was plenty of people that needed help there. Walk me through what you walking out of that program meant to you. Um, I mean, quite literally or, or figuratively or, or, you know, just describe for me, you know, graduation day or the day that you finally went home. Gosh, it felt so good. Uh, I mean, first thing I did is I um, went somewhere and got a sweet tea and then went to Dairy Queen and got a blizzard because this joint, like they wouldn't even let you have caffeine or sugar. Like mm. I just uh, like I got a, you know, a quad espresso. Like I just <laughs> like feasted. It probably wasn't my strongest move, but <laughs> I was I was missing all the goods, you know. Mm. I got a few days to myself down in Florida uh, before Alicia Anderson came down to spend a week to do a vacation to kind of reunite and mm. um, regroup, you know? And so those few days were, it was some pretty purposeful solitude for me. And it was nice, really, nice. really beneficial. I, I think solitude's one of the greatest spiritual disciplines. So I was really glad to have that because, man, Honey Lake was awesome, but there was a pretty tight schedule of things that you had to mm. go to and, 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 you know, be a part of. And, so to have those few days was good. I got to go see Joby and his church, and, and that was awesome. And then when Alicia and Anderson came and we rented a condo on the beach for uh, about a week, it was such a restorative time. Mm. I, I, 
I was able to send Anderson out to the beach and, you know, Alicia and I are watching him and we just had a special moment of, of me apologizing, mm. which Alicia was so great to, to say, no, 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 you don't, there's nothing to apologize for. And I'm like, uh, okay, maybe, but there was a big toll that, that you had to take, like you, yeah. you had to carry not just the last 30 days, but the last several years of like this roller coaster ride with me emotionally. And I, I, I never appreciated that. And now I feel like I can see it so much clearer. Like I've been journaling about all this stuff that was, was so real. And I, I, I just, I do owe you an apology, Alicia. Mm. I'm very sorry. You know, maybe it was out of my control, but I wish I had the courage to stand up and speak out and to get help right. more than I did. And, um, it, that week was so significant for us and our family. It was, I, I think for the last three years, we've trusted each other so much more than we did the first like 12, you know? And I think that, I think that me getting healthy and, and, you know, owning my culpability in it, even though a lot of this was a physical thing that was happening to me, it was, I don't know, man, it was, it was really good. I am not only grateful that Jim got the help that he needed, I might just be slightly more grateful that he is so open to sharing the whole process, trusting that God can use it to help someone else. If you know someone dealing with these kind of challenging times, maybe it's depression or anxiety or something like it, please, at a minimum, be praying for them. And if you need to find the courage to ask them some hard questions or suggest that they look into some kind of professional help, pray about that too. Yes, mental health can be a very touchy subject, but you caring about someone who means something to you could be the catalyst to that person getting the help that they so desperately need. Make sure that you are following The Nook on your favorite podcast app. I've got some more great conversations coming up as we continue this deep dive into the topic of depression. Thank you so much for listening, and I will catch you here next time in The Nook. The Nook Podcast is a production of Sozo Digital Media.